Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please share the link in the description and click the join button below for more details. My name is Salah, and today we're continuing to investigate tests for financial contagion detection. And in one of our previous videos, we learned about the Forbes and Rigobin correlation test for financial contagion. However, researchers have been slowly realizing since then, since 2002, when this test was proposed, that there might be something more to financial contagion that cannot be captured by the correlation coefficient alone. And it is mostly related to the changing uh, properties of asset return distribution subject to crises. Uh, theoretically, you could quite easily presume that as uncertainty increases and uh, we move on into a crisis environment, investors would start exhibiting an increased preference for skewness. They would not want to hold assets that have got more downside than upside during crises, especially so, and therefore they would uh, express their preferences by, well, uh, divesting from negative skewness assets and investing into positive skewness assets. Uh, this theoretical foundation allows one to believe that financial contagion can be manifested as changing cost skewness between assets, which is a relationship that can be calculated based on the higher moment of the stock return distribution. Again, for correlation, we would simply look at the second moments of the series, again, uh, how one variable uh, fluctuates in line with another variable. Very simple, very theoretically relevant as well. However, Koskinas goes one step further, and uh, it is involving the third moment of financial time series. Koskinas can be conceptualized as how does the mean of one variable fluctuate with the square of the other variable, or the other way around, how does the square of one variable fluctuate with the mean of another variable. Quite nicely, uh, apart from the argument uh, that uh, dwells on the shape of asset return distributions, this can be also conceptualized as the change in relationships between volatility of one variable and return of the other variable, and vice versa. And this allows to capture a more diverse and a more rich picture of financial contagion than the simple correlation test can, arguably. This test has been developed in 2010 by Fry, Martin and Tang, and will apply to the same very simple case of US stock and bond markets from a year-end 2018 until year-end 2020, and we'll choose the famous WHO announcement on the 11th of March 2020 as our breakpoint between non-crisis and crisis times. First of all, we calculate daily returns by dividing the consecutive uh, values of total return indexes onto each other. Again, nothing difficult here, applying them for both uh, markets and throughout the sample. Now we need to calculate period-specific and uh, asset class-specific volatilities and means or averages. So here we calculate the sample standard deviation of stocks in a non-crisis period, which goes all the way up until the 11th of March, which is up until row 301. We can also drag it across and calculate it for bonds. Then for the uh, mean, we can simply copy this formula and substitute the sdv.as function with the average function. For the bonds, we again drag it across. For the uh, volatility in the crisis period, we need to remember that our crisis period starts from the 11th of March 2020, over here, row 302, and it goes all the way to the end, year end 2020, which is row 507. Here again, we can drag quite efficiently, and for the mean, we can change the function to the average and calculate it throughout. Finally, we can calculate the sample size and the correlations. Correlations uh, do not go directly into the test statistics. We don't care about how correlations change here necessarily, but as proven by Frank Martin and Tang, correlations are important in estimating the standard error of our test statistics, so we need to calculate them regardless. So for the sample size, we can calculate the count until the breakpoint, so until the 11th of March 2020 non-inclusive, 
And then, post-crisis, we calculated all the way until row 507. 299 non-crisis observations and 206 crisis observations. So the correlation, we apply it again to both of our asset return series in the to both of our asset return series in the non-crisis period and in the crisis period. As in the previous uh, video, we see that the correlation between stocks and bonds has increased slightly uh, after the crisis started. But we're not interested in correlation here, we are interested in co-skewness, which are the analogs of correlation that do take into account the higher moments of the distribution. And if we look, we can see that there are two types of co-skewness we can uh, calculate, which is the co-skewness between uh, returns of stocks and squared returns of bonds, or co-skewness between the squared returns of stocks and returns of bonds. Here the analogy of uh, mean and volatility relationships becomes much more clear. So we need to calculate four different co-skewnesses as we uh, can choose two periods, crisis, non-crisis, we'll evaluate how much it changes, and also depending on which asset goes in first as a mean and which asset goes second as a variance component of cost skewness. So for the cost skewness of um, mean of stocks and uh, variance of bonds in the non-crisis period, we can simply use the average function and then plug in the uh, formula and translate it into the language of Excel. We'll plug in the stock returns, again non-squared, until the 11th of March 2020 non-inclusive. We'll subtract the specific mean, which is stock-specific mean in the non-crisis period, divided by the respective volatility, times it by the squared scaled returns of bonds. So minus the bond-specific non-crisis mean squared, and divided by bond-specific non-crisis standard deviation squared. And that allows us to calculate the cost skewness. We can see that's quite close to zero, meaning that uh, the volatility of bonds did not impact the mean of stocks that much in the non-crisis period. Then we can actually drag it down and here simply change our cell references. So again, we just need to change the cell references for the data as the cell references for means and standard deviations change automatically as we drag it down. And we see that the cost skewness between uh, stock returns and volatilities of bond returns is now quite substantially negative, meaning that uh, variance of bonds is negatively associated with uh, returns of stocks and the other way around in the crisis period, which is uh, interesting and uh, something that could not have been captured with simple correlation alone. And this is the um, informational value. Uh, that uh, Fry Martin and Tang Coscunus test adds to the picture. Now, for the uh, Coscunus between a variance of stocks and returns of bonds, we can copy this formula across and just change the bond uh, component to the linear one. So just uh, delete those squares and introduce them for the stocks as well. We can see that there is quite notable positive cost skewness between volatilities of stocks and uh, returns of bonds. Uh, this could be interpreted as when stocks are volatile, bonds enjoy gains. This uh, is sort of the safe haven property of uh, government bonds illustrated here, arguably. Uh, and for the crisis times, we can see whether this changes massively. Again, square the stock-specific data here and delete the squares for the bond-specific data. We see that this figure has not changed much. Actually, the um, expression of the safe haven property of government bonds, again, keep in mind that those are very short-term uh, government bonds, one to three months maturity, uh, we can see that this is indeed uh, quite um, stable with time. So now we can check whether the differences between uh, two types of co skewness that we've just measured are statistically significant between the non-crisis and the crisis period. But first of all, we need to uh, calculate the adjusted correlation, again, to 
uh, make sure that our results are not affected by heteroscedasticity and to measure the standard error of our uh, test statistic for coskewness properly. So the adjusted correlation here would be the crisis times correlation divided by the adjustment factor, which is the square root of 1, plus the um, variance increase uh, in the market of origin. Again, here the property of the Forbes and Rigobin test that we need to select the market of origin where contagion comes from, and uh, in our case it's the stock market. Again, uh, you could select the market based on uh, the theoretical rationale, kind of the conceptual framework of your research, uh, but in terms of just empirically choosing one, you can see that it's the market that has the highest volatility increase during the uh, crisis period. So we calculate this adjustment factor based on squared volatility of stocks in the crisis period, minus the squared volatility of stocks in the non-crisis period, divided by the squared volatility of stocks in the non-crisis period. And that is scaled by 1 minus the crisis correlation squared, which uh, adjusts our crisis period correlation by uh, almost a factor of 2, quite notably. And then we also need the non-crisis correlation, which does not need to be adjusted, and that is just 0 0.0078. And these correlations go into the calculation of our final test statistic. This is quite a bit different from the Fisher transformation statistic that we used in the Forbes and Rigobin test. It is a chi-squared statistic that um, is basically a one-tailed statistic as this is a squared result when we compare it to zero. So we basically don't measure explicitly whether coskewness went up or down, we measure whether it changed significantly. And this is the uh, form that is explicitly proposed by Fry, Martin, Tang, and we'll stick with it. So in the numerator of our expression, we've just got the uh, difference between coskewnesses in crisis and non-crisis period, and we can make two tests based on the 1-2 coskewness, which is the coskewness between the uh, means of stocks and volatility of bonds, and the 2-1 coskewness, which is the coskewness between the uh, volatility of stocks and the mean of bonds. So let's uh, get on to it. And for the chi-squared statistic, we first need to implement the numerator, which is uh, coskewness uh, in the crisis period minus the coskewness in the non-crisis period. And we divide it by the square root of four times the adjusted crisis correlation squared. And again, as we would like to do this test twice, I'll just lock this expression as it does not change uh, depending on the coskewness type we use. And we divide it by the crisis sample size, which I'll lock as well for the, for the same very reason. And then I'll add four times the non-crisis correlation locked and squared plus two, divided by the non-crisis sample size locked. Then we close the parentheses for the denominator, close the parentheses for the statistic itself, and square it. And we have got a chi-squared statistic of around 3.6, and as we drag it across, we'll be able to calculate the same statistic for the different type of coskewness. And for the p-value, we just plug this chi-squared statistic into a chi-squared right tail distribution with one degrees of freedom. And we see that the result for the 1-2 coskewness, which is again the relationship between mean of stocks and variance of bonds, is statistically significant at 10%. Not overwhelmingly significant, but something is there, you could say. And the other type of coskewness, which we interpreted as the one highlighting the safe haven property of um, short-term government bonds, uh, well, there the change is very small and uh, insignificant. Uh, P-value is uh, roughly 88%, which is quite a lot and does not warrant the rejection of the null hypothesis of no contagion. And that's how you can measure financial contagion and form a more nuanced view on the properties of the contagion process based on the coskewness test on Fry, Martin and Tang. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider support us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.